So hi, my name is Floyd Müller from the Zurich Games Lab. Welcome to our interactive presentation of the Zurich Games together with Robert Kohl, Catherine Gurling and Regan Magnick. A little overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk definitions, a uh, spectrum of exertion games, uh, frameworks that we personally found very useful, and opportunities that arise when we consider exertion as part of HCI, and future directions. Probably the most uh, famous example of the exertion game is Nintendo Wii. Um, it's been around for a while. Anybody want to guess in which year it was announced? Sorry? 2007. 2007. Very good. 2006. Almost there. So over 10 years it's been around. Um, very uh, uh, successful commercially. Sony Move came out quickly after. And then the Kinect. We all know about that. I uh, just want to highlight that commercially well, there, that wasn't the first trend. Uh, it was maybe the first trend at home. But in the public it was certainly that sense of revolution that sparked that phenomenon in um, SEC and much earlier. Exertion games existed even earlier than that, and we couldn't quite agree which one was the first, but there's definitely several, um, in particular, uh, bike-powered exertion games that date back um, even earlier than the 80s. But we would argue that the most current and prevalent form of exertion games are now these um, jogging apps, such as Nike Plus and Run Keeper, because they allow you to um, track your jogging activity and then engage in a race against yourself or against other people, and that allows for a competition, and competition is a form of a game. Other uh, uh, prominent examples are Ingress or um, uh, Pokemon Go, because they allow you to play by navigating an urban environment and therefore exerting yourself through um, uh, this navigation. And Academia has also embraced exertion. Uh, this is from this year's program. There's a session with the word exertion in it. I counted at least four other sessions um, that had um, relevant content in there. Um, if you looked at Interact and Kai Play, you can select exertions one of your keywords. So there's certainly um, an embracing going on from academia um, as well as the industry has pointed out. It brings me to uh, our definition of exertion games. We define exertion game as a digital game where physical effort is a dominant determinant in affecting the game. Important words here are physical effort and affecting the game. Because that is in contrast to what you might also have heard as extra game. Extra games are usually defined as a combination of exercise and gaming. And for us, it's a bit ill defined because if you just look at combination, you would consider that um, operating a game with a mouse and keyboard while running on a treadmill, also an extra game. But here it doesn't affect the game uh, or the game's outcome, and therefore, this is for us not an exertion game. This allows us to create a spectrum of exertion games in which we then can categorize uh, exertion games. Of course, this is not the only one, but we found that particularly useful. On one pole of this spectrum are games that sit more with a digital component and on the other more of a sports component. And if you look at here to the left of that, um, games that sit on this digital component one example here is, for example, uh, one example here. One example is Tetris weightlifting, which basically uses Tetris and then replaces the mouse or gamepad interface with a weightlifting machine. It's a very fun game, but it's very much um, the, the game itself is still Tetris. Versus, on the other hand, you have games um, on the right-hand side of the spectrum that basically come very much from the sport domain. And uh, an example here is copy paste skate that allows skaters to practice their sport of skateboarding as it is, but then is augmented in some kind of digital way through visuals, audio, or uh, there's even haptic feedback through the floor vibrating. And um, what we personally found often very intriguing um, and more stimulating are actually games that sit kind of in the middle of the spectrum. And an example, and a commercial example here is Kinect Adventures, if you ever played that, I highly recommend that because this is a very nice archetypical example where if you would just play that with a mouse and keyboard, it would probably be a terrible game. If you just look at the exertion that it facilitates, it's not really a sport either. It sits nicely like in that intersection. Okay, I move on to frameworks. 
Um, these are frameworks that we personally thought were very useful in our practice. There's of course other frameworks, um, for example, a couple of frameworks is behavior change is often being used when it comes to exertion. Um, but it's not specific to exertion, right? You can use behavior change to also um, change behavior about smoking. So here we focus on frameworks that are specific to exertion and also that were really useful for us personally. Um, Leyban is a framework um, uh, based on, uh, comes from dance. Tekla Shikos is actually the paper here around that, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. But it basically um, highlights the fact that movement, cross, mo cross motor movement, is not just about moving in X and Y space and over time, but also the effort or weight being put into that movement. So if I put my hand out to you, you're really good, we, we are really good as humans to identify whether the effort that, and the weight that I put into that turns this hand movement either into a handshake or into a punch, because we put weight into that. Which is, you know, we humans are really good at detecting that, however, cameras might not sense that difference so easily. So this is, that framework is really good to identify that. And then there are frameworks that are concerned with the joy of movement. Some of the authors are also here at Kai. Um, here, I just want to highlight that they basically emphasize that um, there's joy, that movement is joyful for, the, for its own sake. In contrast to some other frameworks that you know, emphasize a reward for movement. Doug Sven has proposed this really interesting work based on phenomenology, where uh, he argues that there's a first, third, first, second, and third person perspective on exertion. First person perspective basically means my personal experience with that exertion. Second person is the you perspective, where I um, inquire how other people around me deal with that exertion. And third person is the, um, the he, she perspective, which is like the more object or the objective view on, in contrast to the first and second, which are very subjective, so the objective view on that movement. So I'll give you an example. If you do like a stretch exercise, and you know that one of them is these here, and you might, then from the first person perspective, I might go, ah, I'm actually stretching quite a lot, and I must bend over quite a lot, leaning a lot. However, if I then look in a mirror and look at the same movement, you probably realize that you go, I'm actually not stretching much at all. This is not as close to the floor. My hand would not be as close to the floor as I thought it would be. And that's the difference between the first and the third person perspective um, in a Floyd simplified way. Movement-based game guidelines um, is a website um, developed by Spister um, and where we interviewed um, uh, practitioners who design these games in order to derive some guidelines. And you can just go to that URL and you get some really, hopefully, easy to use guidelines for you and your students to use. The next framework is, um, I should point out the bias, it comes out, out of our lab, um, but we found that really useful because it gives us four lenses on exertion activity. And this is where the interactive part comes in because I wanted you to um, now please stand up and do a little bit of exertion with me, just a little bit. You can also just stand up for me for a second. And we're going to do a really simple exercise where we just put our arms out and we put the feet shoulder width apart. And now I want you to basically um, slowly sit down but just stop just above the chair. So you hover just above the chair. And if you don't feel anything yet, then I put your shoulders back and basically try to do a 90 degree angle between the floor, <laughs> your legs, and your thigh, and your back. And you should have a nice little exertion experience right there. <laughs> right? Okay. Great, thank you. <laughs> a very, very simple exercise that you can do with your students. And then basically highlights, uh, this is you right there. And it basically highlights that you can have four, four views on this little experience which is important for the design of these associated games. So the first one is what we call the responding body. It refers to the fact that your body responded through that to that activity, and most uh, often in the form of heart rate going up, which you can measure with a heart rate monitor for very easy, easily and simply. But you can also look at the moving body. This is where the Kinect shines, because it measures body limbs in relation to other body limbs. But Exertion never happens in a vacuum, it always happens in a physical environment. 
and therefore this is the sensing body. Right? For example, you could put a sensor into the chair to see whether you're hovering or actually still. And these chances are, sensors are usually very cheap. And the last one is the relating body. And this basically refers to the fact that because you did this little exercise here in the room with other people also doing the exercise, we know from sports science that you're able to actually, that this changes your pain threshold and therefore you are able to do the same exercise for longer just because there's other people in the room doing it with you. It's a very, um, uh, uh, really fun, fascinating effect, um, unique to exertion in a social context. And so unique that I want to highlight that aspect here, the relating body, a bit more. Because we can do, we do really interesting things thanks to the digital now. Because we can argue for a bodily inter interplay dimension. That bodily inter interplay dimension basically highlights that there's two key types of social exertion experiences. One on the left is parallel exertion. And parallel exertion is pretty much if you are in a 100 meter dash. Right, a 100 meter dash. Um, I'm only going to talk about uh, competitive games for now, just for the simplicity of this presentation, but it equally applies for collaborative games. A 100 meter dash basically means that. Can I just get you here for a second? Sure. <laughs> All right, so a 100 meter dash. Yes, so we're going to do a 100 meter dash. In a 100 meter dash, we're basically trying to achieve the game's goal by running as fast as possible, right? You don't have to run away. Um, okay. But the idea is we both you know, look at the goal uh -huh. and we don't interfere with each other because the line on the, on, the, on the track basically told us that there is no bodily interplay between us. So I can only win if I'm faster than you and no chance. Or the, yes, <laughs> can only beat me if he, he runs faster. So this is the body uh, parallel exertion. However, interdependent exertion, like wrestling, boxing, a, a brawl, we look at each other, our actions depend on each other's actions. <laughs> right? And that is really interesting because here we can have offensive or defensive actions. I can either try to push him, hit him, or prevent him from pushing me. This allows me to play offensive defensively, which wouldn't make any sense in a 100 meter race. The only way to have like a, some kind of interference is if you yell at him, which you would never do, but you know, like bodily, I don't have any interference there. And that's the key difference, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the interesting thing here now is that we know this from sports in the physical space, right? But we now can have that same thing in the virtual space. I know not all games have like a spatial character, but most of them do. Most of them have avatars represented in a, spatial, uh, in a space because of the spatial aspect of movement. And what we can do here now is we can mix and match these places. Most map, so, sorry, most games map um, uh, one characteristic to the same in the virtual space. For example, Nike Plus um, uh, or any other jogging app for that basically map that parallel exertion in the physical place when we jog next to each other into that virtual space, right? It's a simple mapping. Here also our avatars don't interfere with each other. They also engage in a 100 meter race or a jog equivalent. So here the mapping is from the parallel to the parallel. And then there's interdependent uh, uh, experiences that are mapped to interdependent experiences in the virtual space. For example, Pac-Man hand. Pac uh, is, a, is a game which is basically taking Pac-Man, but is played in the streets of Manhattan. So people dress up, dress up in costumes, and are Pac-Man and the pills, and they push, push, each, push each other and cut each, others off, cut each other off, go around the corners, and we play that in the streets of Manhattan. So what's happening here is we go from interdependent play in the physical space to interdependent play in the virtual space. So that's kind of like the default. But what you can do now is see that there's here two um, unexplored areas. And one game that does that up here is Kinect Boxing. That does really, really well. Because what happens here is, if, again, if I can get you, again for a second, if you play Kinect Boxing, right? This would be boxing, but Kinect makes us look towards the screen. So, and we can't hit each other because Kinect is really bad at sensing body contact. So here the designers of Kinect Boxing made a box against the screen, but of course then there's an avatar, so I'm playing the avatar now. The avatar gets hit by me, Floyd, and then I hit the other avatar, and the other avatar punches that player, right? 
but that, and that the avatar gets, you know, bounced back with a punch. But of course, you don't experience any of that feedback because there is no force feedback. So what these uh, designers here did really well is actually that unlink between being hit, bouncing back, and not experiencing it is happening so fast that it doesn't actually disturb the gameplay. Thank you. <laughs> so this, you can mix and match these experiences here now. And if you really want something that for your students to explore, is this space be fine. Because there's hardly anything out there. Um, I'll give you an example um, of, uh, that we came up with, which is hard rate wrestling. Where you wrestle another player, but then you measure their heart rate. And the winner is, not who wins the wrestling, but the winner is who gets their heart rate up the highest. And this is, we think, a really novel and unique exertion experience that is only enabled by the technology. Okay, so here you have a couple of frameworks that we found particularly interesting, and now I want to um, talk about opportunities that we think arise thanks to exertion, and are very unique to exertion within, within HCI. Exertion affords performative play. Here's an example from my uh, colleague, Doug Wilson, um, JS Jaws is a game in which you hold a Sony Move controller and you have to move it rather slow to keep your light on, but then you have to slap other people's Sony Move controllers. And as you can see here, it's not just about slapping the Move controller, but because it's played in an open environment, it becomes a performance. And that's because, you know, as soon as you involve exertion, you involve gross motor movements, and they become more visible to other people. If you were playing on a game, but other people could see what you're doing with your arms and moves. And here's a very performative play. And there's two parts of that. There's primary performance and secondary performance. Primary performance basically refers to movements that are affecting the game, the game's outcome. And here's a famous study by uh, Nadia Retus, who we really like, and it's about uh, Guitar Hero or Rockstar, which we know is not fully exertion, but it equally applies to more exerted experiences. This is, um, they gave Rockstar to a bunch of people who never played it before, right? And they played Rockstar, and then they asked them how much they liked the game, and they said eight out of 10. And then they gave the same game to a different group of people who also never played it, but they told them about that Rockstar move. Remember that? That gives you about triple the points. <coughs> and then they asked them again, you know, like how much did you like the game? And the answer was nine out of 10. So this is the primary movement, you actually like the game more. But the really interesting thing here is, these people who did the Rockstar move, they don't only like the game more, but they said they think they are more likely to become rock stars themselves. <laughs> and so that's the same thing with the Nintendo Wii and Nintendo Tennis. And it doesn't teach you how to become a better tennis player, but through this primary movement, you think you could become a better tennis player. It's a really unique characteristic when it comes to exertion. It's not only primary performance, there's also secondary performance. Secondary performance is if you do that fist pump, like Nadal does a lot, right? If from a cognitive standpoint, you would say, Nadal, never do that, right? This costs you energy. Why don't you use that energy when you actually hit the ball? <laughs> but if you ever play tennis, or actually any sport for that matter, you know how important that is to psych yourself up, to uh, intimidate your opponent, and to excite the audience. Very important part. But in most games, you actually don't see that supported in any way. It's a big opportunity. Next opportunity, exertion affords easy fun. This is another uh, study we love by Nadia. Um, here, players were given, um, had the chance to play a game of bongos. And they played the same game, yes, the same game also with mouse and keyboard. When you play a mouse and keyboard version of the game, they very much, the players really very much try to win the game by getting as high of a score as possible. It's very much as hard fun of trying to beat the score. However, if you involve cross motor movement, it becomes more performative and therefore more social and therefore more easy fun. Next one, exertion facilitates physical health. That's a statement that's often been um, used, but also as often um, debated. And Joe Marshall has a paper here about Kai, where he argues about the dangers of just putting it down to health. We agree with that because we see exertion facilitating personal growth as being much more important and interesting. 
particular, we point to the work by Sarah Pell, who is an adventurer, artist, and also a researcher, who um, attempted to climb Mount Everest. And of course, she didn't do that to increase her physical health, but you know, through the two years of training, she increased it. But mainly, she uh, uh, in, had a, an adventure, epic adventure, that facilitated personal growth. And in the paper there, it's been argued that these adventures, we can equally apply them to these mini adventures that we have when we engage in exertion, and they can also facilitate personal growth. So not designing for specific health outcomes, but rather for personal growth. Now I want to talk about research directions that we think are very important. Uh, one is actuation. When it comes to actuation, you think about it like force feedback, haptic, uh, tactile feedback, but it's mostly small scale. But when it comes to exertion, you want it large scale. It's really hard to find appropriate systems for that. However, we think one interesting thing are exertion machines that are uh, uh, emerging. And one of these exerting machines, or an archetypic example for that, are actually e-bikes. We think e-bikes are super important. Here's an example. We hacked an e-bike in a way that if you lean forward, it actually accelerates the engine and therefore amplifies your exertion. It's also got a speaker that makes a sound when you lean forward and accelerate enabling you to have this like superhuman power when you engage in exertion experiences through the actuation that 90 watt power engine affords in there. So these exertion machines we think are really, really intriguing uh, areas for future research. Exertion physical impairment is totally underdeveloped we think. Uh, for inspiration look at the work by Catherine Yearling on the, just for the benefit of, for example, uh, people in wheelchairs and uh, playing exertion games. Sustained engagement um, is very important. We often get asked about that. Um, we want to highlight that things such as virtual gym, who gives you like a workout routine, are basically still very much um, based on data from sports science um, um, a while ago, done with professional athletes, which is very different to athletes, people who engage in exertion activity who have a work life and a social life, a family life, have to manage all that. If you have to go to a conference, your performance is very different if you are in a city like here, which is a mile high. And we don't have any really data models that help you to actually support that. It's all based on professional athletes um, and very, very rudimentary still. However, what we do now have is data from things such as Trava, that gives us lots and millions and millions of data points of how people cycle, run, and different terrains at different times of the day over Easter, Christmas, in the dark, um, doing snow and so forth. But what we don't really have is analyze that big data to inform the design for future systems. We think this is one of the um, great opportunities that we have. So these are the research uh, directions. I wrap up with giving you a summary of what you heard. We talked about definitions as well as a spectrum. We talked some frameworks and did some little exercises. Thank you for that. And as well as we highlight opportunities and future directions that hopefully inspire you and your students um, to take this research further. What we learned personally from this um, writing this paper, we started off with thinking, oh yeah, we've done a bit of work in that. We know everything that is. We can write it together. But uh, by the end of it, we really realized that we're only at the very beginning of this exciting journey. So that's our take home message there. I want to also highlight that if you want to have, if you're interested in that, we are hiring, uh, as well as we have a summer school on the topic, so talk to us after that, if you're interested in that. And after the last session today, hopefully the weather's fine, we actually got an experience exertion, we meet outside 301, you can leave your bag there, and then you go jogging around the conference venue, there's a really nice uh, creek there, and um, enjoy jogging while talking tech and HCI and these version. My name is Claude Müller, together with Rui, Catherine, and Regan. And we thank you for attending our talk at the Exertion Games. I'm from the Exertion Games Lab. Thank you very much. Questions for Floyd? Ken, please say your name. Thank you, Floyd. Elena yeah. Hagen, University of California, Santa Cruz. So I'm going to repeat the exact same question that I asked you in the other paper. 
and it's about <laughs> the definition of exertion gains. So uh, again, it seems like now exertion gains uh, can include a wide variety of experiences, including things that may or may not be seen as gains. They may be seen as activities or sports or anything. So I wonder, because I, I found extension games, the concept really, really useful when I was working, when I was writing my thesis, but if anything can fit into the category of extension game, I would like to hear about how you think if that's going to be useful uh, for people. I mean, it's going to be definitely useful to people working and expanding extension games as an area of research, but for designers, is that, do you think that's going to be useful? Uh, and how? <laughs> Good, thank you. Thanks for the, the extended version of that question. I hope I answered the last one a bit. Uh, that, uh, um, uh, but, but I see what you mean. Uh, like, first of all, when, uh, and this is an overview article, right, written by several authors who came from different dis disciplines and all different, um, different works. So we had lots of discussions where we tried to refine the definition again and looked at other people's definitions. And, uh, so this is our definition as a group. Um, I mean, you know, definitions are always for me a helpful tool to do interesting work, whether it really, uh, whether you know, whether you want to do work, whether it fits within that definition or not. As long as it's great and cool, I'm happy with like not also um, uh, specific about definitions. Um, I think what we highlight with we want to highlight with the word exertion that is a contrast to Kerbal and mouse and keyboard interactions. Right, that's one thing. So like movement-based games? Yeah, movement-based games. But then other people also put out, you know, for example, ask, what if I uh, exert myself without showing much movement? There's not many examples, but you can probably imagine that if you really, really um, have, you know, tighten your muscles, which you then can measure with the sensors mentioned earlier. And uh, so there's not much movement going on, but the movement is within the muscles themselves. So it's not... There is exactly, yeah, so you know, that's what I mean. Like, we had, this, we had exactly these discussions. Um, so, we, we highlighted that this is a contrast to the prevalent work of mouse and keyboard, that these games afford novel opportunities that we can't just, you know, with the um, weightlifting Tetris, that we can't just replace the interface. You have to design for these new formative um, experiences. And, um, and these words are important, so we want to stress something with these words. Can I? Uh, okay. We're getting low on time, so one more question if it's quick. Is that okay? Just a short question. Okay. How do you think about the, uh, the future opportunity for uh, cognitive enhancements through exam games? For example, for uh, cognitive enhancements through exam games. Yeah. So we know that playing video game can help people to uh, improve their cognitive, cognitive capabilities. Mm -hmm. So do you think that exam games can add some more benefits to this or not? Yes, yeah, absolutely. There, there, there are studies in that. You heard from someone there. I uh, just didn't put it in the talk. Um, yeah, there's lots of research that shows how you, um, and yesterday actually uh, uh, you mentioned it in there. For example, if you take for a, a, a low exertion activity like a walk in the woods, how your prefrontal cortex actually um, uh, goes down in activity and the motor uh, part of the brain goes up in order to release new um, cognitive ideas. So, yes, definitely, absolutely. Thank you very Thank much, you. Lloyd.